Haltet ihr den noch um oder? Haltet ihr den noch um? Okay, ja. Yeah. Good, uh, no, not good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Everybody is still fit. At least we have some, some people left who want to go climbing uh, with me. So I would like to take you up today on an 8,000 meter peak. And these um, 8,000 meter peaks are in the so-called death zone. Um, what, what is the death zone? Uh, what is this all about? It's about um, yeah, climbing into thin air where there's a, such a lack of oxygen that maybe we have only 20% of the oxygen left. And therefore, um, you usually go by campsites. So in the traditional site, that means that you have camps, and there's camp one, camp two, camp three, um, maybe even camp four, where you go up, you use supplemental oxygen. I don't know, has anybody already been on an 8,000 meter peak here? No? Yeah? <laughs> not, not yet. Um, and we're jumping a little bit. And this is what it, this is what it looks, would look like um, if, we are, if we are talking. Funktioniert this thing? Otherwise, we do it without. We will survive. Ah, okay. Here we go. Yeah, this is a picture taken from Pakistan, from, Amer from my first 8,000 meter peak. And you can see what it means um, being in the, in the death zone. It's, um, yeah, the oxygen is, there's such a lack of oxygen that we hardly can breathe up there. And our goal was not only to climb these 8,000 meter peaks, but to say maybe we can climb them within, I don't know, 16 hours or 24 hours as opposed to a couple of days. Um, as I said, usually it's via camp style, you have to build up different camps, so camp one, camp two, camp three, there's tents, there's um, sleeping bags, you have to bring a lot of logistics up. And we said maybe we could just do that within yeah, 16 hours, as with our first 8,000 meter peak, Gashabram 2 in Pakistan. And there, please don't hesitate, it doesn't matter now, I just talk without presentation, it doesn't matter. We, we do it without pictures. So, um, what does it mean to start really from the bottom with hardly anything? Um, to reduce everything you have. If I would invite you tomorrow that we all go up to, I don't know, Zugspitze, the highest peak of Germany, just south here, um, in the direction of, of Garmisch, then we tend to pack in a little bit more. Um, this is how we are, we human beings. We are occupying more than 30,000 things, I mean, physical things, as human beings. Um, more than any um, hunter um, before us, so we are successful hunters. And the decision was, um, what do we really need? What is essential to go up? What do we really need to pack in? Because we tend to pack in more. If there's a backpack, we put more and more and more, and this is the same with our garages and with our, um, I don't know, with our cupboards, uh, with our, um, where we have a lot of apparel things, where we have here and there and all, and so, but most of these things we don't need. If we were sitting there in base camp and the day had finally come to climb into the death zone, um, the target was maybe 16 hours up and down with almost nothing, the hardest decision was what do I not take up? So what do I leave away? Because we knew if we bring up more, we will be slower. The more you have in your backpack, the slower you will get. And in the end, it was about to cut every single lace, to cut every single piece, to cut every single gram. Gram for gram for gram is another gram, another gram, another gram, and in the end, it's another kilo. And then there's another kilo, and in the end, I came up. And now, for example, just three months ago, where I was climbing in a 7,000 meter peak in Nepal, directly from base camp, I started with seven kilograms total weight. Seven kilograms. I think that's. Most of us are not going in the office every morning with uh, less than seven kilograms, it's rather more. And um, that's including skis, boots, drinks, um, bindings, everything you have, um, and usually this takes days. And that was probably the most beautiful experience I made uh, to really concentrate on the essential, um, on what, is, what do I need in order to survive? That was the question. What do I need in order to survive? And to have this continuous state of flow with only a couple of things. Um, again, seven kilograms was unthinkable um, almost, I don't know, 10 years ago when we did this first 8,000 meter peak. And I think this philosophy or me methodology um, I brought not only into my life 
as a family father of three, but also as a CEO of, um, yeah, of today the world market leader in ski touring equipment. The first thing when I got into this company in 2003, when the company was bankrupt, was to cut 60% of the product line, um, where everybody was scared and, oh, and how can we do that and so on. But it was the best thing we could do. In the first year, we doubled the turnover. It was a small company then, only from three to six million. But we were immediately break even only because we were reducing to the core. And the credo was always develop the core, add more. Um, so if we talk about adding, I first want to talk about skipping. I think we can, first of all, also looking at our planet and looking at everything, um, we can add by skipping. And it's about every little cup we are buying, right, the coffee to go cup, to the plastic bag in the supermarket, to the next car ride we maybe could skip because we take whatever. It's about these little things. We can do a change as a little, um, but together it's more. And if I, again, I immediately said when I was asked to, to talk here today, um, when the topic was, um, what can you add? Then I immediately said, no, we should talk about what can you skip? <laughs> you know, this was, was my, uh, my way of thinking about that. So, the credo back to the company was develop the core, add more. So we started with one segment, um, and then we did the next segment, and the next segment, and the next segment. And again, also as a family father, and who is family here? Quite almost, oh, hey, a lot of family. So a lot of family here, and we all know how the households get bigger, and how we get slower, and how we, no. But again, the most beautiful is to say, okay, what are we leaving away? What is the essential? We only have 24 hours. I developed within, um, all that time where I lost, unfortunately, also good friends and, and partners over the way on these 8,000 meter peaks, I developed a more natural, I would say, relationship um, to death, with death, because it's part of life. That's how we are. We all have 24 hours, day by day, um, and one day it's going to end. That's how it is. And being conscious about that we have these 24 hours and that we are not doing everything because we, we think we have to, or we are squeezed in that, or we need that, or here. Um, no, it's about what can you, what, how can you really live that day according to your philosophy and to your, um, to your own style, I would call it. Today I know that we can bring more into, day, into a day by skipping, by leaving away, to concentrate on the essential. I'm not go attending every meeting, I'm not reading every email, um, I'm not going to every birthday party, I'm not going to every wedding party, and um, I'm doing the things which I think are core to reach the target. Of course, um, also looking at the responsibility we have towards our, I don't know, family, stakeholders, and so on. So, um, we are almost at the end. I would have loved to show you a couple of, of nice slides from 8,000 meter peaks, what it really looks like to go into the death zone with almost nothing, what skipping really looks like in a physical, yeah, to get a physical feeling as opposed to maybe the traditional style you've seen. Um, but we're gonna do this the next time, maybe on the next uh, DLD conference, the, we're gonna get the slides done. And then we, uh, yeah, we skip. And I wish you all the best for your expeditions to skip um, what you can. Thank you very much. <laughs> but maybe, maybe you guys, if you have any questions, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer them. Is there anybody who has a question? What's the next expedition? The next expedition. Um, there will be uh, there are two projects lined up. One is will be in the Alps, um, which is in my right now in my head. I think it's a, it's a, um, I can just say it will be about one day, but it will include three countries and, and three different summits, very um, core summits in the Alps, and and all human powered as I as I usually like it. So without yeah without, I don't know, cars or, or all these kind of things. And the other two projects which are in my mind are um, about higher peaks in, in the Himalayas. But I first need to, need to uh, sort a couple of things out before I can do that. Yeah. I think there was another. What was the hardest thing to skip? Um, Almost everything, I would say. I mean, the, the hardest things are, as I said, we had to think about what we need in order to survive. And there are two things um, which are really important to survive. First is that you have enough um, 
insulation, I mean being warm. So the question is how much do you take up um, and, and what do you leave away to really sort out everything that your feet, your fingers are remaining, remaining warm. This is also a great part of the performance. Um, I would say the hardest thing was, was almost everything. In the end, I, I, I only went up with, another, with an additional down jacket, with uh, crampins, of course, with the ice axe. Um, with 1.7 liters to drink, not 1.8, or not 1.6, but 1.7, um, with 10 power gels in my pocket, and, and that was it. Um, so there are a lot of other things where you might feel more comfortable to have them or, or so on, but really to say, no, that's absolutely, that's absolutely the, the, the essential minimum I have. And that also means to, again, cut every lace. I mean, we, we would have come across like the total freaks, and probably we are, but uh, in the end, it's another, it's another gram. That's, that's how it is. Please. Astronauts actually um, pose a very similar question. And I've heard some astronauts talking about what they take up to space. Um, that they always take uh, one item that is giving them emotional stability. Um, that is maybe for other people not necessary to survive, but for that person is necessary to survive be because of their emotional connection. So my question to you is, did you take one item that other people would say would not be necessary, but for you was necessary? Um, emotionally? Um, only in... Good question. Uh, I think a very good question. I have, to t I, have, I have to tell three stories about that. Um, three different stories. The first one is, I was um, at the eighth, eighth highest mountain in the world and I had so many little gadgets from my family, from my uh, girlfriends. I would have almost said girlfriend. There was only one. And... Um, <laughs> and I, as far as I remember, I don't know. No, uh, so I had all these gadgets and, and these bring you luck gadgets. And, and at a certain point, and I always had the feeling oh, I have to take all these, and I had, I don't know how many, what do you call it, chains and, and this and here. And at a certain point, I said, and I was really sitting in base camp, and I said, okay, I cannot, I don't want to rely my, I don't want to have a bad feeling because I have, I have, I don't, they didn't bring up my personal luck gadget because I had like 100 chains. Of, and so I said, no, not anymore, that's it. Even, even things from my birth and I don't know what my mother gave me and so on, because I said, no, I don't want to rely anything in that. It's, I, I, it's, it's your performance, um, it's your decision, you have to take these decisions, and it's, you, you are not relying any decision on these kind of things. Okay, this was number one. Um, five years later, I was at Manaslu, and I was in a... Um, <clears throat> we were victims of a massive avalanche where 11 people died. And due to a, I don't know, due to an instinctive decision we took that day, is that we, are, that we were looking for different camp spots, so we were... Um, out of the traditional camps, I mean, there's no traditional campsites, um, as you know them, but we had built our camp on a, on a little glacier lip um, further away, and the same night there came a, a massive avalanche, one of the largest disasters we have ever had in the Himalayas. Um, as I said, 11 people died, we went in, we were digging out people, we were trying to rescue them, we were waiting for six hours, finally helicopters came, took them out, and... Six days later, I, I climbed Manaslu in, in record time from base camp. Never had anybody even tried to do that, except us five years before. That was in 2012. I was on the summit after 15 hours. And the only thing I took up was um, there was a local priest, one of these lamas, um, who gave me before... Before the expedition, it was a couple of, maybe two weeks before this avalanche had happened, he gave me a little scarf, um, a white scarf, which was a, a really a holy scarf, and I took up that scarf, and I also took up um, a carabiner. Is it called carabiner? Yeah. I took up a carabiner, which I found, um, I wasn't thinking about, but while I was working in the avalanche, digging out people, and I was, um, most of the people, of the victims, they didn't even have shoes on because the avalanche is like an explosion. Everything was thrown away. And I had picked up out of that battlefield, everything was lying around, not only people, but things. And I was picking up this carabiner, and I, I was clipping it into my harness. And what I did is I took all these boots I could find there, and I was clipping the boots towards this, this um, carabiner, and I brought the boots to the people, and then the people could walk or maybe make it themselves, or they had already frostbites or something. And what I took up that day for the speed ascent was that scarf and that carabiner, and I, I digged it. Um, I was digging it at the summit, and it was really a way to find my freedom. And even though it was a couple of grams more, but in this case, I really felt um, I want to bring this up, and, and I want to make my freedom with that, um, yeah, with that disaster we only had six, six days before. 
Um, and the third story, I forgot about. What was the third one? <laughs> um, what I wanted to bring up. No, I think that was, that was almost about it. Yeah. The third, yes, the third is, is, my, is this one, which has a special meaning to me, um, because I had two friends who had the same. We got it in Tibet and before another expedition, and there were three of us, and two of them are not living anymore, and this one I will never take off. Yeah, that's for sure. Another question, please. Uh, you said it would have been possible a few years ago. So basically, um, how do you see this relation between, let's say, performance-driven and also the technical advancements of your industry or also the discussion of technology towards a bionic self and like the enhancements of the body, etc., and the basic idea to be alone as a human in the nature? So uh, how is your relation there, let's say? What is the basic, like the mindset and the body, and what is the industry that you are working with? How do you see this relation? So you mean, uh, did I get the question right between mass, mass tourism and, and or what? No, more like the technical advancement of uh, seeking now the better performance, as you said, going faster up there, uh, leaving things out. But on the other side, in the end, like advancing your body with technology, let's say. So ah, okay. Um, advancing your body with technology in, in terms of... Everything, like the communications that you have up there, GPS... The yeah, system, yeah, uh, okay. GPS, uh, now I got you. Now, of course, um, yeah, two things. I mean, even for me, uh, when I was now on, on Dalagiri uh, um, three months ago, I was the first time I didn't have overboots, for example. Even though it was freezing cold, my, one of my friends, I didn't even know about that, he had this pair of socks, which were amazing. Um, really the latest technology I've seen in terms of keeping your feet, feet warm. And that ma really makes a big difference, because I could leave out my 1.5 kilogram overboots, which I usually have, and which I always had on any expedition. But here I could, leave it I could really leave it away. So there's a massive advancement. Also, if you look at the total gear setup, we are bringing up my skis. And boots and bindings um, and skins. Um, the total weight is two point, maybe three kilo, two point five, two, two, two. I mean, that's nothing compared to, as I said, to a couple of years ago. Then to your second question, of course, we have a massive advantage as compared to um, to climbers in the past who had to uh, take decisions based on what they see. Of course, we still have to work with our instincts, and that's a big part of it, and instinct is nothing else than, um, I don't know, immediate uh, awareness, um, knowledge, and, and, and experience. That's the mixture. But on the other hand, we have a lot of data today, a lot of data we can, uh, we, which is supporting us in terms of, um, for example, decision-making according to the weather. Of course, the weather forecast is still not the best, it's different from here, but it's much better than having nothing. And in the past, there were a lot of accidents because climbers, I don't know, they said, ah, it looks okay, and then they made their way up, and the weather was changing, and they had no, no chance. So, um, yes, it's really reducing, absolutely, it's not only reducing risk, but it's also enhancing performance, definitely. Yeah. Good. Any other question you want to get rid of? Yes, please. Ah, they would love it. I mean, the business <laughs> model is based on putting more and more on their back, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 but more and more on their back from other... Now, of course, um, I think they would also like it because it's incredible what people are bringing up there. I mean, if you talk about Mount Everest, that's really a... Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a place where you have agencies where um, these agencies are handing out summit guarantees. So summit guarantees means you pay the amount X, dollar X or euro X, and this agency says, we guarantee you that you get up there, even though you don't even know how to, I don't know, put on a crampon or something like that. And so that's pretty dramatic, and you can imagine that these people are not very experienced in, uh, about um, not only climbing, but also what to bring up and what not to bring up. And so the Sherpas carry up a lot, and I think they wouldn't mind to carry up a little bit down. It's more about, I think the question goes a little bit broader, it's more how far, how far do we go? I think talking about Mount Everest, because it is, Mount Everest has more, more um, climbs than any other 8,000 meter peaks. We have 14 in total. Um, I don't know, what do you think out of 7,000 successful, um, successful summits 
uh, summit climbs of Mount Everest, how many of them have, have uh, taken place without supplemental oxygen? Without supplemental oxygen. This, by the way, the, one of the, the, the heaviest parts you have to carry up because usually it works that way. One Sherpa is pushing from the, from the back and he's carrying the stuff of the client and the other one is pulling from the front and he's carrying the oxygen um, bottles. So what do you think? Of 7,000 climbs of, of, uh, of Mount Everest, how many have taken place without supplemental oxygen? 5%. How, sorry? 5%. 5%. That would be uh, 7,000. Pardon? Yeah, 200, about 200. So we wouldn't see any cues 200 since the first climb of Hillary, who, by the way, also climbed with supplemental oxygen, so we cannot, climb, we cannot count him. But, uh, but since then, 200 people only reached Mount Everest without supplemental oxygen. That's not a, not a very high number. Uh, please. What's the relationship to Reinhold Messner? To Reinhold Messner? Um, I, I don't have a big personal relationship, <laughs> so that's number one. Um, but uh, certainly one of the, let's say, one of the guys I, I always looked up to in terms of, um, I mean, he was, an, an, there is no question what he did in a, in, as a pioneer and in, in terms of courage and in terms of just going that way. I think there's not only um, many climbers out there, but there's not only, there's not many people out there um, who just, who just overpassed borders in the, in the way he did. So there's, most of all, great respect of what he's done. And then... Pardon? Is it a role model for you? Um, in many ways, yeah. Not in all ways, but in many ways, yeah. Absolutely. But there's also, there's also new guys coming up um, where we have really interesting, interesting mountaineers. I think it's interesting when... when um, I come from performance sports, but it's always interesting if... Um, a higher dimension of intelligence meets performance sports, let's put it this way. I mean, we're also sponsoring a lot of athletes, but sometimes um, what is missing is the creativity, the creativity of really, you also need creativity in order to overpass borders. And this creativity is often missing with performance uh, athletes where I'm sometimes surprised, but it's actually that way because they're very um, narrowed in their target and probably they have to be in their target to reach that, but um, there's so much more sometimes left and right where we could transfer that performance into a wider, wider scale. Yeah, I have to open the next panel. Good. It's, it's always a running between the two stages. I think Benedict is an amazing. Thank you. <laughs>